Good evening and welcome to Tucker Carlson tonight. Former CIA Director John Brennan has proven to be many things. He is dishonest, having lied to the American people multiple times while working as Director of the CIA. He's irresponsible. He's accused his political opponents of treason, a death penalty offense, without offering any evidence at all. But above all, Brennan is vocal. For the past year, he has shouted his views on every possible political topic, as is his right. Well, giving his opinion is literally his job now, actually. He's a cable news pundit. Yesterday, the Trump administration finally revoked his security clearance. Now, why was John Brennan able to keep his top secret clearance after leaving government in the first place? Do other MSNBC contributors have security clearances? If so, what national interest is served by that? And how did somebody so obviously limited intellectually get to be CIA director in the first place? Those are all valid questions. No one on the left even bothered to try to explain any of those things. Instead, they started yelling about how Brennan's rights were being violated. He knows the Russian collusion angle, and that's what Trump is trying to silence. Nixonian-type practices of trying to silence anyone who's willing to criticize this president. The, the larger implication here is the jeopardy to our First, our first Amendment rights, and by extension, others. Hear that? The First Amendment. Because you really don't have freedom of speech unless you also have a top-secret government security clearance. Brennan, of course, agreed with that. He wrote a piece claiming that Trump revoked his clearance, quote, to try to silence anyone who would dare challenge him. Where was Brennan's essay about being silenced published? Well, in the New York Times, a newspaper with three million subscribers. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is what it looks like to be muzzled. Senator Richard Blumenthal of Connecticut, who not only is a fake war hero, but also a graduate of Yale Law School, argued that Brennan somehow has a constitutional right to a security clearance. Notice how Blumenthal keeps a straight face as he says this. Watch. It is not only an abuse of power, it is illegal. When the founders of our great nation decided on the First Amendment, it was because the King of England would retaliate against his critics. Mm. He has the authority to do a lot of things, but not in a way that violates the law. Hmm. Thanks for the lesson on the law, Senator. So here's the takeaway. John Brennan has a constitutional right to a federal security clearance, though he does not work for the federal government. You do not have that right. Neither do I or anyone you know. Only John Brennan has that right because he resides in a special class of elites that you are obligated to obey. And by the way, if you disagree with any of that, you are a monster. You are on the side of bloodthirsty dictators like Stalin and Pol Pot. Watch as more dumb people talk. What we're seeing today is this is what dictators do. This is a dictatorial exercise of power that should frighten. It's a clear abuse of power, and it's a mark of an authoritarian dictator. This is a, a, a striking move towards authoritarianism. You know, this is what dictators do. They shut down the press, they shut down dissent, they jail their opponents. So he's a dictator. Let that settle in for a minute. If Trump is a dictator, he may be the single most incompetent dictator in world history. For example, he lets all these morons go on cable television and accuse him of crimes, but doesn't do anything about it. They keep talking. Somebody better alert the secret police. But wait, the secret police are busy right now. They're watching MSNBC and nodding along in agreement. It's that kind of dictatorship. A looser, more Mediterranean version where no one actually gets repressed. Of course, if you're looking for a more Germanic style of authoritarianism, we have that too in the United States. But it's not in the White House. It's in Silicon Valley, which is happy to prevent you from expressing your views in public if they disagree with those views. That's everywhere these days. And yet, amazingly, somehow, the champions of speech you just watched, First Amendment absolutists like Senator Blumenthal, who learned the value of the Constitution while pretending to serve in Vietnam, haven't noticed. It's odd, isn't it? Maybe Mark Stein can explain. He's an author and columnist, and of course, a friend of the show, and he joins us now. So I wonder, Mark, as these august legal scholars lecture us from their purchase on cable television about how the Constitution requires John Brennan to have a security clearance, and if he doesn't, our First Amendment rights are being violated, do they notice that people's freedom of expression is being violated every day in real ways across the country by the tech titans? Do, uh, it, do you think that even computes, yeah. or they're taking too much money from Google to care? Uh, 
no, you're right. You're right. There's a contradiction there. And the left's position seems to be, which is amazing, actually, when you think when you think back 15 years when they were all going bananas because George W. Bush was supposedly trying to find out what library books uh, you were reading. They're apparently now cool with spooks having super First exactly. Amendment privileges. Now, I, I'm actually with Senator Blumenthal. I think we might as well have a constitutional right to a security clearance because uh, uh, about, <laughs> three or four years, about three or four years ago, just under five million people in this country had security clearances, which is uh, more than the population of New Zealand or Norway. And that's one of the reasons for the dysfunction of the intelligence community. Uh, I think it's now down to about four and a half million with security clearances. But at that level, actually, everybody might as well have security clearances. Uh, so I'm with Senator Blumenthal. Security clearances for, in fact, in an, uh, an effort of bipartisan compromise, I think that uh, as uh, unaccompanied minors are coming across the Rio Grande in a skiff, uh, that ICE should hand them their security clearances. So, Senator Blumenthal, <laughs> go for it. <laughs> I like that idea. Uh, mm. And it's probably going to come true. But the mm. irony, again, there are so many layers of it, but that these are the exact same people who are telling us that we don't have a right to know what our government is doing. We don't have a right, right to know the pretext under which Carter Page was spied upon by the Obama administration. And we're, by the way, quizlings if we ask too many questions. But somehow John yeah. Brennan has a right to read classified information. I mean, how could, no, you, I, how could you make that argument without turning red with shame under, by no, his dumbness? It's, in actual fact, if you read John Brennan's column in the New York Times, it's actually faintly creepy. Uh, because at one point, he, he actually says at one point, I want to make sure I get this right, that a variety, he, a variety of politicians, political parties, media outlets, think tanks, and influencers, that means you, Tucker, you're an influencer, you're readily manipulated wittingly and unwittingly by Russian intelligence. So you, Tucker... You don't even know you're being manipulated by Russian intelligence. But the fact that you're objecting uh, to John Brennan telling you you're being uh, manipulated by Russian intelligence is the clearest proof that you're being manipulated by Russian intelligence. This is all this guy's got. And this is why, if he wants to be this idiotic in public, if he wants to be just another uh, obscure MSNBC pundit, he should do it without a security clearance. And one, one other thing, Tucker, when they say, oh, this is the action of dictatorships, you can say a lot of things about dictatorships. But one of the things that you can say with certainty is when the dictator removes you as head of the intelligence security apparatus, actually you lose your security clearance in not only in <laughs> yes, dictatorships... In, in dictatorships, in uh, almost all other countries, this idea of ex officio security clearance, it's bad enough. You know, one of the yeah. ridiculous things about this country is because you don't have viscounts and dukes. Somebody who was a senator from uh, 1972 to 1978 gets called senator until the day he dies. And now we're saying that uh, aside from that, he should also have a security clearance until the day he dies. Ex officio security clearances are a stupid idea and they should be abolished across the board in real dictatorships former intel heads wind up like barrier <laughs> so yeah. i mean no, it's also right. so stupid but yep. thank you yep. great to see you as always Thanks ethan merriman is a radio show host thank you in california ethan joins us tonight so ethan i you know i didn't go to yale law school couldn't get in um but where in the constitution does it say that former spies are required to keep their security clearances the issue here, Tucker, is if the government wants to impede on your ability to express yourself, which we have two separate issues happening here. We have the attacks on the free press that are happening, the enemy of the people. And then separately, if I revoke your security clearance because I don't like what you're saying, which is what's going on right now, that is an attempt to silence you in your criticism of me. If well, I how was is it John that, well, hold on. But how is it? Hold on. Well, let's start to first principles here. What national interest is served by giving MSNBC contributors top secret security clearances? How does that right. help? So the for the, the point last, of all of this is to help I, the country. At least the last at least six administrations, maybe it's five, have retained those security clearances 
after they've left office because the current sitting CIA director, for example, may want to refer to the previous CIA director for information about an operation, some inside scoop on why they were doing something or what they were doing. And instead of having to go through a security clearance every single time that they wanted to have a conversation about it, you kept the security well, no, clearance No, no, I, in look, place I understand, I understand how the system, hold on, the system has worked, but we're not talking about the system, we're talking about John Brennan. So how does America benefit by John Brennan having a security clearance? I'm, I'm completely confused. If the sitting CIA director wants to confer with him about, for example, hey, what led you to uh, investigate the Russians that were visiting the RNC or going to Trump Tower? What was behind your thinking on that? What was the information that led you to hand that well, over to somebody else? He doesn't need a security else? clearance Where to have were that you on this? He doesn't. Hold on. Whoa, 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 whoa. Hold on. You don't need yes, he does. John Brennan to have a security clearance. No, no, that's not true. John Brennan does not need a security clearance in order to answer straightforward questions from someone in government. People are subpoenaed all the time. People Trump. speak voluntarily all the time to government without security clearances. So I don't understand. No, for the private I mean, conversation. Look, you know the truth. No, there, there's no. The, John Brennan can answer any question he chooses to answer. He doesn't need a clearance. And I, I'm just wondering, like, I mean, the truth is, this is insane. There's no scenario that you could create where we need to give John Brennan a security clear, a clearance. That's a privilege that he has. It's a tradition that we have. It may or may not be justifiable, but it's not his right. I mean, that's insane. He's an unelected bureaucrat who now works as a contributor on a cable news channel. Just like you, just like me. We don't deserve security clearances, do we? Uh, no, no, we don't deserve it. And what's interesting, though, again, is there are two separate issues that are coming together here. One are the daily attacks on the press. It's the we are the enemy of the people, ex except for you and some others here. But most most of the press is considered the enemy of the people. And now that Brennan huh. is on one of the less favored networks, he's an enemy of the people. And therefore, one of the ways well, to but, silence him is to very publicly revoke his But how does that, how does that silence? What do you mean? Why does he have it? And look, it's a measure of the depth of the corruption that he would have a security clearance in the first place. There's no scenario where the rest of us benefit from that. It's another stupid Washington tradition. I can tell you, having lived there all my life, there are many of them. And this is one, and it came to light because this show brought it to light, and it's totally indefensible. So rather than defend it, they're just like, oh, it's a... You have, B Richard Blumenthal says you have a constitutional right. It's illegal to take away his security clearance. What that's, I mean, how is that true? Exactly. Well, actually, there is there's a, an argument for that. So in administrative law, at least, uh, Tucker, to take away somebody's livelihood. So in this case, maybe his security clearance could be argued that that is the source of his livelihood. Well, I mean, why is he at MSNBC? For ex I mean, oh, because he was so CIA that tells you right because there. he had security so, clearance. Oh, I get it. So so you're conceding no, that there he's are using this. Wait, wait, hold on. No, wait, hold on. Wait, possibly. what you're saying is that John Brennan is viewing top secret information and using that in his role no, as an no, MSNBC no. contributor. Well, what else are you no, saying? I'm saying that that, I mean, that if that's like central that to his livelihood. In that. Well, no, John Brennan shouldn't be using top secret information to which he has special access in his role as a cable news pundit. No, I, I'm not. I'm not suggesting that he's using that to view <laughs> I mean, classified no, information. What? That is a credential. That is a credential that gives you a well, job. It's, I mean, it's meaningless unless you can exercise it. No, and that's not even why you retain that, that, again, that privilege is, so the CIA director has information that is new, for example, since your operation when you were CIA director, to have the conversation about the continuance of the operation. But you can you have, have that have conversation. Clearance. You don't, no, no, you can ask John Brennan whatever you want. He doesn't need a clearance for that. This not is, to present this is a window into how totally corrupt our system is. It's totally corrupt. And the people benefiting from it have no self-awareness at all. Oh, you're violating my constitutional rights. Ugh. <laughs> Ethan Sachs is spinning me up. I appreciate it. Good to see you. Thanks, Tucker. I want to bring you a Fox News alert tonight. The Pentagon has announced a delay, they say, to President Trump's planned military parade. The parade was originally scheduled to take place November 10th, the day before Veterans Day. It has been pushed back to sometime in 2019. The overall cost, which is inspired by a similar parade in France, expects it to be $80 million in that ballpark. Obviously, we'll continue to follow the story as it develops. Up next, a Mexican restaurant owner in Texas is being targeted because he dared serve dinner to the attorney general. He is Hispanic, and so Univision says he should not be allowed to do that. One of its anchors joins us next to explain how that works.
Well, the left claims to love Hispanics, but that love seems to evaporate very quickly if individuals take the wrong approach on politics. Here's one example. Houston restaurant owner Dominic Lorenzo recently took a photograph with the Attorney General, Jeff Sessions. He said he was proud to host Sessions at his restaurant, which is called El Tiempo Cantina. Lorenzo didn't endorse Sessions' as politics. He just said he was happy to serve a prominent American. But that was too far. Now the restaurant is being barraged with calls for a boycott and Spanish language channel Univision is leading the attack. Enrique Acevedo is an anchor over at Univision and he joins us tonight. Enrique, thanks a lot for coming on. Of so course, I misread pleasure. this whole thing. I thought you guys were a news network. I didn't know that you were enforcers of ethnic solidarity, but you are. So your job is to make certain that if a Hispanic in America steps out of line, that you pummel him and make sure he gets back into the herd. Is that how you see your job as a journalist? Not at all. And I'm not sure if you're referring to a specific news report or something you saw on one of our um, <laughs> newscasts. But I, I have no about recollection Jorge, of us Jorge doing anything Ramos, like that, our, our mutual friend, Jorge Ramos, is calling, in effect, for this restaurant owner to be punished because Hispanics are not allowed to eat with Jeff Sessions. And I just I was just wondering, I, mean, I thought in 2018, regardless of your race, you could eat with anyone you wanted. But that's not true, I guess. Right. According to that's not that's not what Jorge said. And, you know, I'm not surprised this is happening. Oh. This is what a divided America looks like. It's a result of the trickle down in civility that starts with the president calling women dogs and immigrants animals, uh, journalists enemies of the people, and then it spreads everywhere through the kind of incendiary rhetoric we hear from you or Sean Hannity so, or Laura Ingraham. So you're saying that, that Donald Trump is controlling Jorge Ramos's brain? Does Jorge know that? Of course, uh, Donald Trump doesn't control, I don't think, anyone's brain. Sometimes oh, I you just said that, that he controls his that own brain. Calling for a boycott. I have to say, it. <laughs> but 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 to be uh, to be honest, I, you know, I think this is what we get when we start, uh, you know, with the hate, the division, with the lack of context, with the resistance to facts that we see in our politics, and that it's also spreading to a larger contingent of what we call the media. So you guys are joining in, I guess. So, but did you think when you Not joined Univision that part of your job would be to attack disobedient Hispanics? Was that in the contract or is that just like something you discovered when you started working there? Of course, that's not that's not something that we do at Univision, and you know Jorge very well. You oh, know that no, 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 it's he something you're doing do right anything now. like that either. Oh no, 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 that's that's literally exactly what he's doing. He's saying this man is Hispanic, therefore he has no right to say anything nice about the Attorney General of the United States. If this guy was African American or Asian or white, it wouldn't be a big deal. But he's Hispanic, therefore he's not allowed to because Univision decides what Hispanics are allowed to do. That's kind of a weird position for a news network, don't you think? There, there's something to be said about Jeff Sessions, about a man and the, the moral contradictions of a man that has opposed every effort to reform our broken immigration system in the last two decades, that has led the charge to the humanize and criminalized immigrants, their story, their culture, and then suddenly shows up at a Mexican restaurant to order huevos rancheros. That's like Cuban officials going to a McDonald's to order a Big Mac wait, after a speech on American wait, imperialism. Wait, 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 wait a second. Was, was, the owner, doesn't fly. was the owner an immigrant? Wait, hold on. Was the owner an immigrant? I thought he was an American. I don't think I don't you know I don't think that makes a difference. Uh, there are a lot of immigrants whoa, 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 that are wait, American wait, 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 citizens. Wait, 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 so wait, no, much, wait, no, hold on, uh, slow, slow down, hold on. So you're saying if you have a Hispanic last name that you must be an immigrant? Is that what you're saying? I mean, that's not an assumption I, I make. There are lots of Americans with Hispanic last names. I grew up next course. to a bunch of them. Of okay, course. so but I mean, why like I said, there are a lot of immigrants that are American well, citizens. So that's a, a you know a peculiar well, I'm, distinction. I'm aware, but but so so he's an American. I mean, I'm assuming he is. I hope he is. I hope everyone here is an American. So he's having a meal with the attorney general of his country, but he's not allowed to because why? Just speak slowly so I can understand this. I, I didn't say he's not allowed. Of course he's allowed. And I think every restaurant should, should be serve their clients. And we shouldn't, you know, I, I'm one of those people who doesn't believe in public shaming and in you know this type of behavior when we see a public official. It doesn't matter if you don't agree with his politics or with the administration that he works for. I actually you don't know, think oh. that we should all be for you. civility. But this is what a divided America looks like. This is what, Wait, I'm sorry to say, it shows so I know like the rules or Sean like, I mean, are feeding. Right. Right. So, okay, I'm feeding it. Right. 
this is a confusing time, 2018. Who knows what the boundaries are? I'm totally opposed to illegal immigration. I think that our legal immigration level should be lower because the country's getting too volatile. Those are my sincere views. Should, I also like Mexican food since I grew up on the Mexican border. Should I be allowed to eat Mexican food? No, no. You know, this is, I think, what people are pointing out, the contradiction of attacking someone's well, no, culture, someone's story, and then well, celebrating their, 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 their food and celebrating what, you mean, their food? Of, or, what they find food? convenient to it's celebrate American. about their story. Well, you think you own tacos now or something? <laughs> I love this. It's of so course crazy. Not. No I can't one does, even... by the way. Oh, oh really? Because it sounds like you yeah. feel like you own tacos. No. I feel like I do. I feel like they're an American food, and I'm going to keep eating them, even though I agree with Jeff Sessions. I'm glad, I'm glad you do. Uh, no, and I think everyone it's... should. Tacos, guacamole, and you know, we should all celebrate each other's cultures. Uh, we feed off each other. It's no. what makes what us mean, each other's cultures. No. It's an American food. Diverse and strong. It's an American food. Feeding off each other's you're cultures. Not gonna borrowing steal. from you're each not other's cultures. Learning from each other's cultures. I'm from San Diego, man. Those are my tacos. Mine. Right. Anyway, thank you. Great to see you. Great to see you, too. <laughs> Democrats in Minnesota outdid themselves this week. They nominated an alleged domestic abuser to be attorney general, while a congressional candidate has been accused of marrying her own brother in a bizarre immigration scam. You can't make this up. We're not going to, but we have the details. They chose the best and the brightest in the state to contend for high office in November. Among them, DNC Vice Chairman Keith Ellison. He won his primary race for the Attorney General of the state. Amazingly, he was just hit, though, with allegations of domestic abuse, violence against an ex-girlfriend who herself is a liberal activist. Interesting, but it gets weirder than that. A woman called Elon Omar won the Democratic primary to replace Ellison in the 5th Congressional District of Minnesota. She has been accused of executing a bizarre immigration fraud involving a marriage to her own brother. We don't make this up. We merely report it. Scott Johnson is a lawyer in Minnesota, founder of the blog Powerline, and a very keen observer of politics in the state. He joins us tonight. Scott, first to the Ellison story. Just to be clear, this is not a conventional Me Too thing. This is an allegation of violence, correct? Correct. Um, but the charges just were made public on Saturday evening, and they are still reverberating. As of this afternoon, uh, the Democrats were asking Keith Ellison to answer questions, which he has so far refused to do. Not all allegations are true, of course, and I think it's always important to remember that. How credible are these allegations? Well, from what I've looked at, I think that they, they are quite credible. Uh, they were originally made by the lady's son uh, on a Facebook post, and they caused people to take a look back at the lady's uh, tweets over the period of time that she was dating Ellison, and she alludes to being the subject of abuse in a Me Too kind of fashion without naming the perpetrator. But in fact, she was dating Ellison at the time. There are photographs of the two of them together, and I think the allegations, it's fair to say, he should not be presumed guilty, but they are serious. I mean, Al Franken was forced out of the Senate for something far less, I mean, far less than this. It'll be interesting to see. So tell us about the, the other, the woman who was just nominated to replace him in the 5th Congressional District, married her brother? Can that be right? Well, I'm still asking myself that question. I got a tip two years ago that, in fact, Ilhan Omar was married to two guys uh, and that her brother was husband number two. And so far as I was able to check it out at the time, uh, I was it seemed to check out and I asked her campaign to comment on what I had found and they sent me back an email from a criminal defense attorney uh, re refusing to respond to the allegations and calling me a bigot. Well after I wrote about it on Powerline, uh, a local reporter for a small publication, small online publication called Alpha News, Priya Samsunder followed up on what I had written, and Priya found all kinds of social media evidence supporting uh, the, 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 the uh, evidence that husband number two was, in fact, her brother. And uh, as Ilhan explained at the time, she had never legally married husband number one, who she has always held out as her husband and the father of her children and explained that she married husband number two for a short period of time eight years later but has refused right. to answer any questions about him uh... in, in the two years since we've been writing about you it. You think of minnesota as such a straight-laced state 
I guess we need to revise our, our view of it. Scott Johnson, thank you very much. Really an expert on that subject, for sure. Thanks. I appreciate your interest, Tucker. Thank you. Drug ODs reached a record high this year. We got the new numbers. C Congress's party naturally is to release thousands of convicted drug dealers back into the streets. We're not making that up either. We'll get to tales next. Brett Kavanaugh. Clinton explained that Roe v. Wade has been indispensable to the American economy. She even put a number on it, suggesting she's thought a lot about it. The 60 million abortions committed in this country since 1973, she said, have added $3.5 trillion to America's GDP. Fewer women doing dumb things like bringing new life into the world. More women doing the vital business of faithfully serving global capitalism. Earning, consuming, earning, consuming, just like Amazon wants. Motherhood does not turn a profit, so get back to your drone work, ladies. Private equity is counting on you. That's the America Chelsea Clinton likes to see. She must be secretly grateful to the Speaker of the House, by the way. Despite promising to stop taxpayer funding of Planned Parenthood in 2016, Paul Ryan has not even really tried to do that. In the meantime, Planned Parenthood has performed another 600,000 abortions. By Chelsea Clinton's math, Ryan helped add more than $35 billion to the economy. Congratulations, Paul Ryan. Shareholders are thrilled by that. Amazon thanks you. America is in the grip of the worst drug crisis in its history, as you know. Each year, overdoses kill more Americans than died during the entire Vietnam War. The numbers are up this year. They just came out over 70,000. You'd think everybody manipulating the levers of power in Washington would be concerned slash panicked about this. You think Congress would be eager to do something to fix it. But instead, they have a very different agenda, one that works at cross purposes getting softer on drug dealers. A bipartisan bill making its way through the Senate right now would drastically cut minimum sentences for cocaine and heroin smugglers. Why? Well, Tom Cotton may have an answer. He is a Republican senator from Arkansas, and he joins us tonight. Senator, this seems an odd time to reduce the sentences for drug dealers, and you've got 70,000 Americans dying of drug ODs. What is going on? It's a very odd time, Tucker. As you say, just last year, 72,000 Americans were killed from drug overdoses, which is a new record. Unfortunately, it beat the record from the previous year. If anything, we should be cracking down on drug dealers. I've got legislation that would increase mandatory minimums for fentanyl, which is a very dangerous synthetic opioid that is made oftentimes in China and smuggled through Mexico. It would also overturn a Supreme Court decision from just three years ago that let many violent felons back onto the streets, armed career criminals. Yet instead, uh, we're moving forward with legislation that may drastically cut mandatory minimums and give liberal judges more discretion to deviate even further from those mandatory minimums. It's very disappointing. Uh, we shouldn't be focused on reducing sentences. We should be focused on prison reform if you want to focus on criminal justice at all. You know, everyone right. in prison is there for a reason. There's a good chance they're going to commit future crimes if they don't get, say, a skill or education or get drug treatment. That's fine. But prison reform is very different from sentencing reductions. If you were going to reduce sentences for criminals, you'd think maybe you'd focus on marijuana users in jail or low-level drug users. Why would you reduce the sentences for large-volume drug traffickers in the middle of the worst drug epidemic in our history? It just doesn't make sense. Who's pushing this? Yeah, so Tucker, the reason why you have to focus on large-scale drug traffickers in the federal prison system is that's really all that's in the federal prison system. Virtually no one goes to federal prison as a low-level, non-violent offender. Just a few hundred people at most. But in those cases, they usually pleaded down from a more serious offense. Now, I can't speak to what every state does in terms of its drug sentencing. Even at the state level, it's pretty rare, though. But at the federal level, if you are in federal prison, you are a repeat offender or you are a serious offender, trafficking in huge quantities of drugs. Yet if you're in the Congress, that's the only system you control. And if you're ideologically committed to having lower drug sentences, that means lower sentences at the federal level for serious traffickers. Very quickly, Senator, are you worried our crime rate's going to go up? I am worried, Tucker, that the crime rate is going up. Mandatory minimum sentences and three strikes laws and taking discretion away from liberal judges over the last 30 years has led to a remarkable decline in crime in this country. However, 
We started to see some increases in crime in the last two years of the Obama administration. And it just stands to reason when most prisoners, when released from prison, commit future crimes, that if we let more prisoners out or shorten their sentences, you're going to see an increase in crime in this country. Yeah, it's not complicated. Senator, thank you. For, but apparently your colleagues need convincing. So thank you for your work on that. I appreciate it. Thank you, Tucker. Up next is final exam. Katie Pavlich is back, going for her eighth win in a row. Richard Goodstein is the man she faces off against. What will happen? Minutes from now, you'll find out. The time has come finally. Final exam, where we pit the news experts we know best against one another to determine who has been paying closer attention to what happened this week. Joining us tonight, Katie Pavlich of Town Hall is back, defending champion. Here are all the opponents she has beaten. She has won seven times in a row. That puts her just two wins behind our all-time board leader, Shannon Bream. Her challenger this week is attorney, Clinton campaign advisor, frequent guest of this show, and noted news expert, Richard Goodstein. Wow. That is, <laughs> I, say, I, I, don't know, I don't know who came up with that pairing, but this is the mo probably the most intense face-off we've had so far. Can I say, yeah, Tucker, I feel for. like... Katie's the Ken Jennings of final exam, uh, and I don't, I don't know. The Ken Jennings. I, I don't know whether I can get to be able to call a friend, and I'm just assuming there's. You can guarantee no, <laughs> no Russian lifeline. meddling. No Russian meddling in this. I, I hope you the can only kind of thing that's going to help you <laughs> is prayer, Richard. So okay. get in touch that, with your spiritual side. Okay, get so ready for it. I know you know it. As a as a weekly uh, watcher of this, you know the rules. But for our viewers who are just tuning in, here here they are. Hands on buzzers. I ask the questions. The first one to buzz in gets to answer the question. You have to wait until I finish asking the question in order to answer it. You can acknowledge, answer once I acknowledge you by saying your name. Every correct answer is worth one point. Every one you get wrong detracts a point from your total. The best of five wins. Are you ready? Ready. As ready as I'm going to get. Ready. <laughs> Let's go for okay, it. Okay, question one. <laughs> the mayor of a town in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts says he is going to boycott which beer company because that company's founder thanks the president for giving corporations a tax cut. Katie Pavlich. Sam Adams. Is it Sam Adams? Certainly the most famous Massachusetts beer. Is it Sam Adams? We roll the tape. A Massachusetts mayor is now boycotting Sam Adams' beer because the founder praised the president. American brewers make the best beer in the world, yeah. Yeah. and the tax reform was a very big deal for all of us. I will never drink Sam Adams' beer again. His loss. Well, that goes to Katie. The losers are the people of Massachusetts who are missing out on one of the great beers. Yes. Um, all right, question two. <laughs> this is multiple choice. The lawyer for Stormy Daniels, the creepy porn lawyer, says he will run for president of the United States. He's thought a lot about himself, and he says one thing makes him most qualified for the job. Is it A, his extensive experience with adult film actresses and pornography in general, B, his love of economics, or C, his ability to listen? Richard Goodstein. His ability to listen. You don't think my it's answer. his experience? <laughs> <laughs> his ability. I'm going to stop there. It, is it? Is it his ability to listen? What makes well, you a qualified candidate for president of the United States? Uh, number one, I'm smart enough to know that there's a reason why God gave me two ears and one mouth, and that's to actually listen to people. Good job. We're tired. Creepy porn yes, liar. You can listen. Help if I guess occasionally. <laughs> guess where it does work. You're right. I wish you'd gone with A, but, you know, whatever. People never live down to your view of them. All right, question three. So we're tied going to question three. Another multiple choice. Last week in final exam, we told you about a man taunting bison at Yellowstone, <clears throat> which we would not recommend. Now, another genius, this time in <clears throat> excuse me, Anchorage, Alaska, got too close to a group of animals that are potentially deadly. What kind of animals were they? Grizzlies, reindeer, wolverines. Go ahead. Uh, uh, Richard buzzed early. Unfortunately, I have to go to Katie Pavlich. Was it grizzlies, reindeer, wolverines? Grizzlies. You think it's grizzly bears? We're going to the tape. Is it grizzlies? It still makes me nervous just looking at the video. These are grizzly bears. Watch as a man suddenly appears, inching dangerously close to the unsuspecting bears. He even turns his back to them to take a selfie. 
You know, Darwin Katie had a Pavlich theory. W- <clears throat> Darwin had a theory. What was you know, it, Tucker? It was, <laughs> you know what it was. That guy's in the running for a Darwin I know what award. it was, and it was almost <laughs> an action there. Indeed. Impressive. Okay, so it's two to one. Remember, you have to wait until I finish asking the question. And I did cough there, so it was a little confusing. That's okay. Until you answer. Question four. You still have a shot here, Richard. <laughs> president Trump says there is a new leader of the Democratic Party. Which member of Congress does the president consider the new face of the Democrats? Maxine Waters. Katie Pavlich. Max- Maxine oh, Waters. Maxine Waters. You mean the future head of the Financial Services Committee? I don't know. Let's see. Is that right? Stand up for what is right and get rid of this man who is embarrassing us all. Well, today, Maxine Waters' birthday wish it didn't come true, but President Trump did honor her 80th birthday on Twitter. He wrote, quote, happy birthday to the leader of the Democratic Party, Maxine Waters. On this program, we'd also like to wish Congresswoman Waters a very happy birthday. Maxine Waters' birthday. I missed it, Richard. No, you were celebrating. You never called me. I would have come. Um, (laughs) Final question. The wrong address. Sorry. Here Here we we are. Speaking of birthdays, which singer who once publicly admitted to wanting to blow up the White House turns 60 years old today? Madonna. Madonna, says Katie Pavlich. Is it Madonna? Happy birthday to Madonna. Turning 60. Yes. <laughs> I have thought an awful lot about blowing up the White House. <laughs> Happy birthday, Madonna. Katie Pavlich, another victory for well you. Um, Richard, by the way, you should not feel bad. You join a long line of people with the best Thank intentions you. and deep knowledge who were bulldozed by this unstoppable force, Katie Pavlich. Uh, we're really glad to have you. Ken Jennings uh, moves on. Nonetheless. Yeah. Ken Can Jennings moves on. And by the way, Katie, yes, you get another. Another Eric Wemple mug to add to your collection. And we're someday soon you'll be facing off in the Battle of Champions with Shannon Bream. Thank we're you both. Sir. Thank you, Tucker. Sure. Good take game. care. Yeah, absolutely. See you Katie. later. Congratulations. Thank you. That's it for this week's final exam. Pay attention, close attention to the news all week. Tune in Thursdays to see if you can outwit our news experts. We'll be right back.